Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the director of apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see there on the screen, we're going to talk a little bit about J.D. Greer and uh, Danny Aiken. Uh, with a leader, both leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention. J.D. is the uh, presidential nominee along with um, Ken Hemphill. Um, and uh, Danny Aiken is the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, all of which are great brothers. But there has been obviously some back and forth with regard to uh, the different sociological beliefs of the, 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 the various candidates. Danny Aiken has been uh, supporting uh, J.D. Greer and has been defending him against the accusations of being a Calvinist. Now, I was a Calvinist for for 10 years, and I can understand the desire to distance yourself from the label Calvinism. Um, Calvinism has been maligned in a lot of different ways and has many different uh, definitions and titles and and, uh, misnomers about it. And so I understand. When I was a Calvinist for 10 years, somebody had asked me if I was a Calvinist. I would typically have told them no or or, or said something, well, it depends on how you define Calvinism and all those kinds of things. So I, I don't fault these guys for not wanting to wear the label Calvinism. But we've been real careful in our critique of, of J.D. to actually look at his own words from his sermon on Ephesians 1, his, his exegesis of Romans 9, his affirmation of the Acts 29 network distinctives, which are uh, unmistakably Calvinistic. Uh, in other words, we're, we're not just trying to label him so as to dismiss him. We want to understand him in his own words for what he has actually said and what he believes and teaches. Um, not because we're trying to, to malign him or make him look bad. We just want to know the truth so we know who to support in the upcoming election because sociology is important to us, obviously. And so those of us who care about the direction of the convention and nominating our next you know, president of Southwestern, for example, the president of New Orleans, once the presidents there retire, um, the presidency is the one who nominates the, the boards that nominate people like that. And we would like our convention to lead more our direction. Obviously, that, that's just, there's nothing uncivil about that. There's nothing divisive about that. That's just, that's the way the convention's always worked. You know, people choose people who represent their views and their beliefs and the direction they want to go. When, when, when <laughs> it's, it's funny how some people are calling for, don't be divisive by being divisive. Um, you can be divisive by trying to call people not to be divisive. We, we, you can civilly and, and cordially call people out on their belief system. What's, what's not civil is hiding your belief system because you don't think the voters will vote for you if they know truly what you think. That's what's uncivil. That's what's divisive. And, I, and, I, and I'm not accusing necessarily um, J.D. of doing that, though there's evidence that seems to suggest that he might be because he does associate with Calvinist when it serves his purposes to do so and, and is listed um, by the Gospel Coalition is in the top 52. He's number 52 in the top 150 list, along with Danny Akins in that list of those who are the most influential in the, the rise of the young restless reformed movement. So apparently the Gospel Coalition sees these guys as Calvinistic. Um, we, we've, we've looked at the, the, uh, the statement of faith from the Acts 29 network, which is required to be signed off on and taught if you're an Acts 29 church, which J.D. Greer is. And so I, I don't know how else better to discern what somebody's sociological belief is than to look at the statements they have affirmed, to look at the sermons they have preached, which we have tried to do diligently and cordially here. I, I've never attacked the man personally. I, I don't believe there's anything personal to attack. I think he otherwise would be a wonderful leader in every other regards. Um, but with regard to sociology, which is obviously a concern of mine, um, I, I think that J.D. is probably an Armaldian. Um, which is a four-point Calvinist, and he he exegetically affirms those things when he's approaching pa- passages like Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 from what we've seen in the past, and, of course, his statements of faith from the Acts 29 network, which you can go and listen to yourself and read them for yourself and see if you think they sound Calvinistic or not. But um, D- Danny Aiken recently um, had posted a, a, you know, a 
an article defending JD, um, and and just also even just yesterday, JD posted this um, on on Twitter. He said, "How should Southern Baptists respond to the issue of Calvinism?" Question mark. Danny Aiken wrote this helpful article more than a decade ago, but it rem, it rem, remains a helpful, balanced, and gracious answer. And so, JD is giving endorsement to this article, and I would say much of what this article says. I would agree with as well. But I want us to look at it together because I think we can see some nuances and some behind the scenes things that need to be understood in order for us to understand the 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 dangers of not knowing where Omraldian type Calvinists, moderate Calvinists are coming from when it when it comes to the decisions they're going to make with our convention. And again, there's nothing um, that I'm trying to be divisive about in saying these things. There's nothing I'm trying to, 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 to malign him and his character about. I'm just simply saying this is theologically the way he's taught. This is theologically the way he has voted in the past. This is more than likely how he would lead in the nominations that he's going to be making in the future, and therefore we should be real clear about where he stands. But here's the article that Danny Aiken wrote, uh, again, about a decade ago. It says, How Should Southern Baptists Respond to the Issue of Calvinism by Danny Aiken? A few issues are more likely to ignite lively debate than a discussion of the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. That's true. Recent years have been a witness of the renewed interest in this subject in Southern Baptist life, to the delight of some and to the chagrin of others. The conservative resurgence, which began in 79, was about the authority of the Bible. Those who believe the Bible to be the inerrant and infallible Word of God will take its doctrine seriously. Issues like predestination and election, free will, and human responsibility will naturally require our careful study. Thankfully, our theological discussions are not those of other denominations in our day. Issues like the deity of Christ, the exclusivity of the gospel, open theism, abortion, and homosexuality are settled for Southern Baptists because of the commitment to clear teachings of Scripture. However, some issues in the Bible are more obscure. There is often a mystery and attention to what we find when we examine all that the Bible says on some of the subjects. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is clearly the case when it comes to understanding God's sovereignty and human responsibility in salvation. Unfortunately, there is more heat than light in many instances with the shrill voices and unhealthy rhetoric on both sides of the issue. Getting too much attention on one side, you hear people saying that God hates the non-elect, and damns babies to hell. That's extreme Calvinism, I suppose. They say that Jesus was a Calvinist and that Calvinism is the gospel. On the other side, you hear voices stating that Calvinism is heresy and that Calvinists do not believe in missions and evangelism. Some even suggest that Southern Baptist Convention should split over the issue, though I am convinced this will not happen. I believe we need to tone down the rhetoric. We need to seek biblical balance, theological sanity, and ministerial integrity in the midst of this discussion. I would agree with that, absolutely. Let me attempt to set the playing field for this important issue and then make some theological and practical suggestions as we work together for the glory of God and the cause of Christ. Now, wonderful introduction. For the most part, we can uh, nitpick some of those points here and there, but I, I, I think for the most part, he's got the right heart and attitude that he wants to not be divisive. He wants to, to focus on, um, on, on the issue in a healthy way and, and, to, and to work together. But I think it was interesting, the, the, the article he just posted recently kind of defending J.D. about Calvinism, I, I addressed it as well. Let me pull up that post. Um, I wrote this. I, the title of it is just, J.D. Greer is not a classic Calvinist? Question mark. Um, Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote an article yesterday defending J.D. Greer, the SBC presidential nominee, from accusations of being anti-evangelistic or hyper-Calvinistic. Um, I do not know of anyone at least any reputable person, that has brought that accusation against Greer. But if they do exist, then I think Dr. Aiken was right to correct them. And I stand with Dr. Aiken in correcting anyone who's trying to say that J.D. Greer is anti-evangelistic. That's, that's demonstrably wrong, okay? Demonstrably, as someone want me to say it, demonstrably wrong. It's just, uh, it's just false, okay? I do not know of anyone that's done that. My suspicion, however, is that Aiken has intentionally focused on the most extreme and unrealistic criticisms about Greer's sociological views so as to marginalize those of us who have expressed genuine and reasonable concerns. After debunking the false accusation of Greer's hyper-Calvinism, which I've not seen from any reputable source, Aiken goes on to write, quote, Greer is not a classic, classic in air quotes here, Calvinists. 
and he makes no secret of his sociological position both in writing and in speech. I think we should allow him to speak for himself and take him at his word. And then he quotes from the tweet that we went over not long ago from J.D. Greer, which says, For the record, I believe Jesus died for all people, that every person can and should be called to repent and believe, and that you haven't fully preached the gospel if you haven't called for that response. And then he hashtags gospel above all, J.D. Greer, February 6, 2018. John Calvin himself, I write, would likely affirm this Twitter statement by Greer. So is this meant to prove Greer isn't a classic Calvinist? Albert Moeller, R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, Paul Washer would also undoubtedly affirm that statement from Greer. So are we to believe they too are not quote-unquote classic Calvinists either? How Calvinistic does one have to be to earn the label quote classic? <laughs> I agree with Aiken when he says that we should look at Greer's own words. On my broadcast, I did not base my assessment on a vague Twitter comment, but I instead played and engaged with Greer's actual sermons on relevant topics like Romans chapter 9, Ephesians chapter 1. Is there a more reliable source that I should know of than that? How about Greer's affirmation of the Acts 29 doctrinal distinctives, which are unmistakably Calvinistic? Why would Aiken prefer a vague Twitter comment over an actual statement of faith that is clear and un unambiguous with regard to his Calvinistic views? Or what about, Greer, what, what about when Greer said, quote, I would never dogmatically say I am not a Calvinist in his sermon introducing Romans 9, in which he goes on to provide a Calvinistic exegesis regarding God's particularity in unconditional election for individual salvation. Are not those Greer's own words too? In his sermon, Greer's sermon on Romans 9, Greer points to those who die without ever hearing the message of the cross as proof of God's particularity in individual election. In other words, Greer believes that those who die in ignorance of Christ must not have been elected and salvifically loved, in other words, loved for salvation by God. The fact that they never heard the truth of Jesus supposedly demonstrates that God has simply not chosen everyone for salvation on Greer's view. If that's not classically Calvinistic, then I, I don't know what is. Maybe Aiken and or Greer could explain the specific differences in their non-classic Calvinism and that of Dr. Albert Moeller, for example, a proud self-proclaimed Southern Baptist Calvinist. Because I'm not seeing any real distinctions with the difference between the Calvinism of Albert Moeller or R.C. Sproul or MacArthur and the Calvinism that J.D. Greer promotes or teaches, or at least what he affirms in the statement from the Acts 29 network for certain. Apparently, Jared Wilson of the Gospel Coalition agrees, given that both Aiken and Greer made the top 125 list of the most influential leaders in the rise of the Young, Restless, and Reform movement. I cannot help but think Aiken's and Greer's motivation to distance themselves from their clearly Calvinistic views are political given that a vast majority of the SBC laity are staunchly non-Calvinistic. I just ask this, why not be clear about your theological affirmations instead of painting all of us who express reasoned concerns as if we're accusing Greer of hyper-Calvinism when that's never been the issue? And then there's the, the photo that we'd use as J.D. Greer, a Calvinist, and why does it matter? Um, and again, asking that question is not in and of itself divisive. It's seeking clarity. It's not divisive to seek clarity. It's not um, uncivil to ask for clarity on what somebody believes and pointing to previous sermons stating what they believe and previous declarations of faith, statements of faith that they have signed off on to, to seek for those clear, that, that cl uh, clear indication of what they believe. Now, back to the article that he wrote back uh, a decade ago, dec Danny Aiken wrote, and that um, Greer just tweeted out again. He takes a look at Calvinism. Here's the next section of it. The issue that is being debated today almost always revolves around the idea of Calvinism. To some, this is a theological landmine to be avoided at all costs, even if they are not sure what it means. For others, it signals a recovery of biblical truth growing out of the Reformation of the 16th century and its emphasis on the great solas. Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, for the glory of God alone. Now, let me just stop there, because oftentimes, as we've just witnessed with 
uh, Danny Aiken's approach to this issue is he sets up a bit of a dichotomy, and he typically picks out the extremes of the two views to do so. I understand that. I, writers do this all the time. It, it brings the most punch to your point. It illustrates the, the point you're trying to get to. It simplifies it, but it's, it can be kind of reductionistic, and it also can lead to a lack of clarity. Because look at the two group he, he groups he kind of paints here. He said it, it, this issue revolves around Calvinism. This is a theological a landmine to be avoided at all cost from some people. So in other words, some people over here who want to stick their head in the ground and don't want to have anything to do with it, okay? And there's a lot of those people out there. A lot of them that hold to my theological perspective are in that camp. They just don't want to have anything to do with it. They say, yeah, Leighton, you're probably right. I, I mean, I don't agree with Calvinism, but I don't want to have anything to do with this issue. Leave me out of it. Don't even want to get involved. It's just too philosophical. It's too theologically deep. There's too much out there. It's just too hard to unpack. It's like untangling that fishing line. I'd rather just throw the fishing line away and go buy a new <laughs> sprawl at the, at, the, at, the, um, at the store. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. And there are a lot of people in my camp who are like that right now, okay? And they just want to avoid it at all cost. Or they, they are thrilled that this growing um, reaffirmation of these biblical principles, the great solace of, of God's word, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, for the glory of God alone. Those are the serious theological. So you got the guys sticking their head in the sand versus that those who are wanting to go grace alone, God alone, the five solas. Let's fight for the reformation of deep theological, robust sociology. Those are the two camps right now. Do you, do you see it? Now, he didn't come right out and say that those are the only two camps, but those are the two camps he addresses. Make sense? And this is what I'm trying to say. What about us? What about me, Dr. Aiken? And what about those of us who believe in the five solas, who believe in deep, robust theological sociology? And we love to talk on Romans 9. I got a book I wrote on it. We, we love to talk about Ephesians 1 and predestination and election. We have a deep, robust, systematic theology on those doctrines, and we're glad to talk about it. We love to engage with it. We're not running from it. We're not sticking our head in the sand. What about us? Can we have a, a little line right there in that article that says, and there's some of those who disagree with the Calvinistic interpretation, who are deep, robust, and calling for the five solas, who stand with more like the Philip Melanchthons of the Reformation or the Balthazar Hubmeyers of the Reformation rather than the John Calvins of the Reformation with regard to this sociology. And there always have been um, differences of opinion on this dose, different sociological issue. It doesn't mean you have to be um, weak, namby pamby, uh, Joel Olstein type of um, chicken soup for the soul kind of theologians in order to be the non Calvinist. No, you can be a non Calvinist, a traditionalist, a provisionalist, if you will, and still hold to a deep theological understanding and desire for um, the, 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 the deep truths of God in robust theology. And that's what gets so aggravating with us on this side, is being treated as if um, we, we don't want to have a seat at the table and that we really don't want to get involved in this discussion or that we don't have a, a good theological answer to these issues that, that, that aren't even being considered when, when discussing the, the, the different perspectives most of the time. So he goes on to write, John Calvin from 1509 to 1564 was the great theologian of the Reformation. Um, and again, he, he's calling him the great theologian. Um, we've got the quote from J.D. Greer in his Romans 9 sermon that talks about John Calvin being one of the best theologians to ever live. And, um, and then I just go through and I place some of the quotes that John Calvin himself said about determinism. And he, af he affirmed determinism. Um, and I, I don't know how else to describe that except that determinism is that God has decreed, God has decided, God has scripted, all things that come to pass, both good and evil. Everything is a part of and a, the, the, the plan of and according to God's sovereign plan, his decree, his decision. So every holocaust, rape, murder, every evil thought, action, deed is, is originally from God's plan, his purpose, his script. He wrote it that way. Okay, He brought it to pass the way he he deemed it to be. And that's, that's from Calvin, as we've read in dozens of texts. It's also from John Piper, as we've also read and played on dozens of broadcasts here. And so 
if that's if that's the, the what you mean by being a great theologian in the sense that he's his his greatness is found even in his what's known as Calvinism today because that's the issues that 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 is uh, being debated right now that is the that is the point up for contention not other other issues that Calvin discussed that we would agree with but the issue of quote unquote Calvinism has to do with his issue of predestination and soteriology and so to reference him as a great theologian seems to suggest you agree with his doctrine on predestination and determinism. And if it's not, then I, I would definitely uh, avoid using the term Calvinism because that's not classic Calvinism in that sense. Um, an outstanding biblical scholar, he heralded the theology of both Paul. Again, this is Aiken speaking about Calvin. An outstanding biblical scholar, he heralded, he heralded the theology of both Paul and Augustine. Now, that's begging the question because it assumes that Paul's theology and Augustine's theology and Calvin's theology were all the same theology. Of course, that's the point up for debate, whether Paul did teach what Augustine taught. Um, and it's really interesting that it wasn't until the fourth century that Augustine first introduces more Calvinistic, individualized interpretations of election uh, in the early church. All the other early church writers that we have access to exclusively taught libertarian freedom of the will. Even by Calvin's own admission, he, he bemoans the teachings of the early church fathers, save Augustine himself, because they were not clear in teaching on the doctrines of, uh, of God's sovereignty, quote-unquote, or God's predetermination of all things. Um, it was Augustine that first introduced this. Even Lorraine Botner uh, admits this, who is a Calvinistic historian, admits that Augustine is the first that we see clearly teach these, um, these doctrines that they hold dear. Um, he goes on to write, like Martin Luther in 1483 through 1546, he emphasizes the sovereignty of God and the sinfulness of man and the necessity of grace for salvation. Now, it's always interesting that when you, when you reduce these things to these points of doctrine, then oftentimes it looks like this guy, as opposed to us over here, like Calvin affirmed and emphasized the sovereignty of God, you guys over there don't. This guy over here, he affirmed and emphasizes the sinfulness of man, but you guys don't. You guys over here, and the necessity of grace for salvation, but you guys don't. In other words, if, if you're going to talk about the issue that is um, a debate, then why would you emphasize three points that both sides of the debate hold to? In other words, he, 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 he could have said John Calvin emphasized the determinism of God or that God determines all things that come to pass versus saying a vague phrase like the sovereignty of God. Because as we've <laughs> defined it many times here, pull out Vine's dictionary or any Bible dictionary for that matter, and you will not ever find by the word sovereignty, it means determinism, or it means God meticulously brings about or causes all things that come to pass. It, it, it's never defined that way. It's defined as God doing what he pleases. God can do whatever he wants. That's, that's all sovereignty means, that a ruler can rule how he wants to rule. And an all-powerful, all-knowing ruler can rule however he wants. It's, it's what Psalm 115, verse 3 says. God sits in heavens, and he does as he pleases. That's sovereignty, and we all affirm it. But we just also ask the question, what does God want? Okay, We can't assume that God wants a world of automatons. We can't assume that God wants a world that he controls in a meticulous, deterministic manner. We have to look at what Scripture says. And what does verse 16 of Psalm 115 says? The heavenlies belong to God, but he has given the earth over to man. There is a sense in which he has given autonomy to the principalities in, the dark, in this dark world, that he has given us freedom of choice, and that is his sovereignty to do so. A.W. Tozer puts it really well. God did not choose which choices we'll make. He did not determine which cho choices we would make. He did not sovereignly decree which choices we would, be, we would make, but that we would be free to make them. And that a God less than sovereign would be afraid to bestow that kind of freedom upon his creatures. God is sovereign, and it's demonstrated in his choice to give us freedom. I've used this analogy before, and I'll use it again. Our view of sovereignty, I believe, is much more impressive and high, a higher view of sovereignty than the Calvinistic determinism's view of sovereignty. Why do I say that? Let me illustrate. You're walking in a park. You come upon a chess master who's sitting there behind the chessboard all by himself. And he gets up and he goes to the other side of the chessboard. He moves a black piece. He goes back to the other side. He moves a white piece. And he says, sir, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm playing chess. 
why are you playing chess by yourself? And he says, well, it's the only way I can figure out how I can determine my victory, for sure. The only way to do it. I have to play both sides of the chessboard in order to ensure what I want to happen will happen exactly the way I want it to happen. And you know, oh, okay. You walk on down the road a little ways and you come across another chess master. And he has opponents lined up as far as the eye can see. One by one, chess masters from all over the world, the best of the best minds, coming and taking him on. And one by one, he defeats them. 10 moves, 20 moves, 30 moves, 50 moves in front of every one of them, soundly whooping them one right after the other. Which one are you going to go home and brag about? The chess master who is able to beat any opponent because he's the maker of the chessboard and he knows every possible move that could happen. And no matter what they do, his ultimate purposes and his plans, even when they're acting freely, he can bring about his purpose and his plans even through sometimes their evil actions and he has nothing to do with their evil and he's completely autonomously separate from their evil but he's able to work out and to win the game if you will regardless of what his opponents do and he can take on any opponent and always win because he's so masterful at chess or the guy who has to play both sides of the chessboard because it's just the only way he can figure out how to make sure he wins which one is really a higher view of sovereignty in the sinfulness of man he says as if traditionalist or non-Calvinist or Arminians or any other uh, orthodox view that's not Calvinistic doesn't affirm the sinfulness of man? That's not the issue up for debate. So why in the world would you list this as one of the points of, of interest? This is not a point of contention. We all affirm the sinfulness of man. So what's the point of distinction? What he should have pointed here, instead of pointing to the sovereignty, he should have pointed to determinism. Instead of pointing to the sinfulness of man, he should have talked about the inability, the moral incapacity of man from birth to respond to God's appeal to be reconciled from their fallenness. That's what he should have talked about. John Calvin emphasized the moral inability of all human beings to respond willingly, to, to, to respond positively to God's appeal to be reconciled from the fall, unless God does some super inner, inner, supernatural effectual work on them first. That's the point he should have put here. He shouldn't put the sinfulness of man. We all affirm the sinfulness of man. That's not the point of contention. The point that we are contending with Calvin on is his concept of total inability from birth, that you're born incapable in your sinfulness to even respond positively to God's call to be reconciled from your sinfulness. That's the point of contention. He doesn't mention that there because that would be maybe too obvious as to why we disagree with Calvin. And then the necessity of grace for salvation. Please, please do not paint any one of us as not believing that, that grace is necess necessary for salvation. Of course grace is necessary for salvation. Does that mean effectual grace is necessary for repentance? No, but <laughs> grace is necessary for salvation. Does it mean that God has to do some effectual work of regeneration to make you believe and make you repent? Because we, we don't conflate the concepts of God's uh, choice to, to save the repentant with the choice and the responsibility of one to repent. Just because the prodigal son chose to come home doesn't mean that the father had to receive him when he got there. That's the father's choice alone. It's the father's choice alone to reconcile with the, the wayward son when he returns. In other words, there's two choices involved here. There's the choice of the son to repent, and there's the choice of the father to renew him and to restore him, to kill the fatted calf, to give him the golden ring. The choice of the father to reconcile with the son, to save the son, if you will, is completely the father's alone. That does not deny and it does not replace the responsibility of the son to repent, to humble himself and to return home. You are responsible to humble yourself and to return home. God's not responsible for your response to him. He does not effectually cause you to humble yourself and to come. You are responsible to humble yourself. If you're waiting on God to effectually humble you, you will be waiting until judgment because that's when he will effectually humble those who don't humble themselves. You are responsible for that. But if that was listed as the actual point, then that would be the point of contention with Calvinism. He goes on to write, Later in the 17th century, followers of Calvin would systematize his theology and go beyond what Calvin himself taught. This system would ultimately be codified through the now famous acrostic tulip. Now, there are arguments, I think right, probably right arguments, that people like David Allen make that, um, that Beza and others after Calvin, uh, with regard to atonement, went further than Calvin did. But when it comes to um, Calvin's view of sovereignty, quote-unquote determinism, uh, 
There's no doubt of what he believe, believed. When you read his, his, his work on the sovereignty of God, um, on God's providence, he's very, very clear about his, his view of divine determinism. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that um, people after Calvin went further than Calvin did with regard to his determinism, because Calvin is blatantly clear with his, uh, his affirmation of divine determinism, as is John Piper today. Uh, the, the history of Southern Baptists include those on one side of the theological spectrum who have fat, flatly rejected three or more of Calvin's five points and those at, uh, at the other who have enthusiastically embraced all of them, with many Baptists falling somewhere in between. The reality is that the SBC has included five-point Calvinist and modified Calvinist from the start. It should be stressed here that from a denomination standpoint, in this discussion, there is no right or wrong. Now, back up here for just a second, because you've got either in the SBC life, there's either been five-point Calvinist or modified Calvinist. Now, what I, under, what I understand by that is him, him saying things like what we've said in the past, you know, where you people say, or, I'm a two-point Calvinist, or I'm a whiskey Calvinist, <laughs> people have talked about, or I'm a, a one-point Calvinist, a two-and-a-half-point Calvinist, all these kinds of uh, points of Calvinism. And that's not really helpful to the discussion. Why? Because as most Calvinists would acknowledge, a two-point Calvinist is not a Calvinist, <laughs> okay? Because even those two points you hold to, you're not holding to the actual points of their points. Make sense? For example, there's a lot of Calvinists that say, well, no, I believe in total depravity. And then I define what Calvin meant by total depravity, inability, moral inability to respond even willingly to God's own appeals to be reconciled from the fallenness. When they understand that, go, oh, no, 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 I don't believe that. Well, then you don't believe the T, okay? So stop saying you're a one, you're a, even a one-point Calvinist and saying you affirm the T when you don't affirm their T. You may affirm a different T or a lower form of their T, but it's not their T, okay? So this modified Calvinism, our quote-unquote modified form of Calvinism, is not Calvinism at all. Listen, it comes down to one point. I mean, you can come down to one thing. And we went over this with the John Piper quote. Who is the decisive cause of whether you believe and trust in Christ or not? That's it. If you believe God is the decisive cause, in other words, God is the one who decisively causes you, you to respond positively, positively to God, then you are a Calvinist. If you believe you're responsible for how you respond to God's appeals, then you're not a Calvinist. It's that simple. It, 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 it come, that's, that's, that's it. If you think God is the one who decisively causes how you will respond to God's appeals to be reconciled from the fall, then you're a Calvinist. If you believe that you're responsible, in other words, you're able to respond, you're the one who has to decide, and it's, it's up to you to how you respond to his appeals to be reconciled, then you're not a Calvinist. That, that's it. You, you, there's... You can get a lot of the nuances and a lot of other issues, but even John Piper explains it that, that way, that, you, the, that if you believe God is the decisive cause, um, then that, that's it. That, I mean, that, that's Calvinism. And, and no matter all the other nuances you can add to it and everything else, that, that gets down to the, the, the root of it. He goes on to say, it should be stressed here that from a denominational standpoint, in this discussion, there is no right or wrong. Well, no, there, from a, he's saying from a denominational standpoint. In other words, um, you can be a Calvinist and be, uh, you, you, and be a Southern Baptist, or you can be a non-Calvinist and still be a Southern Baptist. In other words, there's no right or wrong uh, as saying that is Southern Baptist. Now, what you can say, however, is that you can say that, yes, Calvinism was predominant in its early years, um, back when Southern Baptists were small and you had like two or 300 people showing up to an annual meeting. Yeah, it was Calvinistic back then. But it started growing into the thousands and the hundreds of thousands and millions when traditionalism was leading it, okay, uh, sociologically. And so to say who we are as Southern Baptists, as the, the largest Protestant denomination in the world, it is marked by traditional soteriology. And that's why we talk about it being a tradition. The last hundred years or so, the, the height of, of Southern Baptist growth and its influence in the world has been under traditional sociology, not under the five-point Calvinism of, of the, the, the few that helped to start the Southern Baptist Convention back whenever you know uh, those, those lines were being formed and, and slavery and all those things were being debated during those times. And, and uh, to, to our chagrin, the history of Southern Baptist, many of the, those... 
uh, founders were also slave owners, and they made mistakes uh, both theologically and practically in a lot of different areas. And uh, um, and so we, we don't we, we we hopefully are growing. We're sanctifying even as individuals, but also as a denomination. We 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 weed out the things that are bad. And, and we, we come to formulate our decisions and make better decisions, hopefully, and grow in our theology. And I think as a Southern Baptist Convention, that's what happened. We grew theologically, and we adapted out of that five-point Calvinism to become traditionalists. And that's when we grew. That's when we were seeing larger numbers of baptisms and, 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 and influencing the world and became the largest uh, Protestant denomination in the world is under traditional sociology. And so... So Southern Baptists have always been diverse in many regards, and the theological realm is no exception. Neither the Southern Baptist Convention nor its seminaries endorse or promote a particular theological system or stance on areas not addressed in the Baptist faith and message. I, I disagree. I mean, if you're, if you're requiring your professors, at least the full-time professors, from what I've, I've been told, to sign the abstract of principles written by Basil Manley Jr., a Calvinist, um, if you're requiring that, then you're promoting one stance over another, and, and that's at least a Normaldian document. It's a, at least a, a, a four-point type of Calvinism, maybe maybe a three-and-a-half point if you want to try to make it into a point system. But I don't know how you can say you're you're promoting the abstract of principles and not and having your professor sign them and not promoting a particular theological system or stance in the areas not addressed by the Baptist faith and message. But he goes on to say, frankly, I don't foresee that ever changing. So what follows is not an endorsement or promotion of Calvinism, but rather a review and condensed explanation of what some of our Southern Baptist brethren believe on the five points of the Calvinistic system. My hope and prayer is that a fuller understanding will help set the stage for what follows in the final section. Now, I want to try to go through this as fast as I can. I know I'm slow on stuff, but I, I just want you to see if he's really highlighting the points of distinction with regard to what Calvin actually taught and what John Piper today teaches with regard to Calvinism and see if this rightly represents uh, Calvinism. He goes on to write, Total depravity, this view holds that man is born with a nature that is bent towards sin. Traditionalists would agree with that statement, right? Sure. Every aspect of man's being is infected with the disease of sin so that he cannot save himself, neither can he move toward God without the initiating and enabling grace of God. Would traditionalists typically disagree with that? Now, we may nuance it a little differently in some ways to give some more clarity, but would we, I, I've used the whole curse of sin as an infection, a disease. Remember the whole crack baby analogy I've used when a, a baby is born with an addiction to crack, it wouldn't be for own, their, their own fault. But it was something they were inherited with. They inherited it. And so they have the effect of sin without being the cause of it. Um, and, and they have to deal with that inclination um, and, the, and those, those problems in the same way we've inherited that disease, the curse of sin. Um, and, and we can't save ourselves. Nobody's arguing you can save yourself. Now, arguing you can repent in light of the, the revelation of God through, through conscience, through scripture, through um, the gospel, through all the truth that he brings us, to say that you can respond to God himself is not equal to saying you can save yourself, okay? We're not left to ourselves. So we, we're not in a world that's left to ourselves. We're in a world where God seeks to save the lost. So we're, we're not talking about we can initiate salvation. We're talking about our responsibility, our ability to respond to a God who has already initiated salvation by sending uh, the, the light of revelation um, Jesus, by sending the scriptures, by sending the apostles, by sending his Holy Spirit down like fire um, to bring conviction to the world, what is our responsibility to his revelation since the fall? And if we're responsible to him, if we're able to respond to him, then then we're not saving ourselves by responding to him. We're, we're throwing ourselves at the mercy for him to save us. And so no one's arguing that we can save ourselves, obviously. Neither can he move toward God without the initiating and enabling grace of God. Again, I would have no problem with that statement as long as you're saying enabling grace and not effectual grace. That's really the only difference. Because what is the gospel if not enabling grace? 
What is the light of revelation throughout our, the, the conscience, throughout God's uh, work within us to help us to know that he exists? Uh, all the things that he's done to make himself known, to, to call us to repentance and to salvation, that's all enabling grace. How will they believe in one whom they've not heard? In other words, bringing the message is an enabling grace. Bringing the truth of repentance and light, that's all enabling grace. But it, it, it's enabling grace, not effectual grace. Um, and, and if a gift has to be effectually given in order for the giver to give get get credit for giving the gift since when's that true a gift is a gift whether you use that gift or not is your responsibility but i'm not going to take away the credit of the giver just because he doesn't give the gift effectually or irresistibly um, and so god enables his his grace he enables through his grace he enables he gives the gift but you're the one who is responsible to walk in it. You're the responsible one whether you take it or not. Um, and so, yeah, enabling grace, fine with that. But that's not Calvinism, okay? It's not what John Calvin taught. Um, that, that's traditionalism. And so if, if you, this is the way you're describing five points of Calvinism, so far you're only describing what traditionally uh, traditionalists have held to, at least from what I'm reading. Man is not as bad as he could possibly be. But he is radically depraved. Again, what, what do you mean by radically depraved? Do you mean total inability? As, as the Acts 29 network, as J.D. Greer signed off on the Acts 29 distinctives, it describes radical depravity um, as total inability. The inability to respond positively to God's appeals through the gospel unless regenerated or irresistibly made alive first. That's what the distinctives say in distinctive number two on Acts 29. I, I'm assuming... J.D. believes it because he must have signed it. He must have signed off on it in order to be an Acts 29 church. Most Baptists would agree on this point, at least in some measure. It is hard to deny it in light of Romans 3, 9 through 20 and Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Agreed. Again, what in there teaches total inability? Because that's what Calvinism means by total depravity. And even Calvinists today say that quite regularly, that total inability is more of the term that they prefer. Okay, let's go on to unconditional election. Let's see if it gets any more or less vague. According to this view, God, in grace and mercy, has chosen certain persons for salvation. Again, um, we would agree that God has chosen certain persons for salvation too. Okay, We just don't believe he's done so arbitrarily before the foundation of the world. Meaning, um, arbitrary, meaning... Um, without taking regard anybody's choices or actions except your own. In other words, arbitrary means to make a decision totally for and by oneself without any regard to anybody else. That's what arbitrary is. I know people don't like that term arbitrary, but that's just, I'm sorry, that's, you can't redefine words. That's what it means. And so when you say that God's chosen people for no apparent reason, in other words, no known reason before the foundation of the world in order to effectually cause them to humbly repent unto salvation, then that's what Calvinists mean by unconditional election. But to say that he's chosen certain people for salvation, we all believe that he's chosen certain people for salvation, but is there a reason that he's chosen one person over another person to be saved? And we would say, well, of course, yeah, he's chosen those who humble themselves and who trust in his word. Those who, you know, Isaiah 66 too, these are the ones that I show favor, those who tremble at my word, who trust in me. Uh, Psalm 18, 27, um, he saves the humble. Uh, brings those uh, low who are haughty. Um, the Bible's pretty clear about who he has chosen to save. He saves those who admit they need salvation and don't try to earn it uh, through their own works and their own righteousness, but who instead trust in the righteousness of, the one, of, of Christ. Um, those who hold to this view believe that his decision is not based on human merit. Okay, His decision is not based on human merit. Let's stop and talk about that for a second, okay? Is God's decision on traditionalism based upon the, the merit of the human? In other words, let's use the example of the publican in Luke 18 in Jesus' story who fell on his face and, and tore, his, tore his clothes and said, God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And, and the Bible goes on to say he, 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 he's the one who went home justified. And then he, for, there, therefore he goes on to say, therefore you humble yourselves and you will be exalted. That's the teaching of Jesus in that, that, that passage. So it's a sociological passage because obviously he's talking about how the man went home justified. And it was about a condition of his heart. He was broken. He was humble. Um, did, did he merit his salvation when he fell on the ground and tore his clothes? 
In other words, does humbly admitting you can't merit your salvation merit your salvation? Of course not, okay? So his decision to justify that man was not based upon that, that man's merit, okay? God chose to do so because he's gracious. It's based upon his grace. And he chooses to do that to someone who is weak and humble and frail and who admits that he can't save himself. So those who admit they can't merit salvation, he puts his merit onto them. Because think about it. If tearing your clothes and, and, and crying out in mercy merited your salvation, then why would Jesus need to die? Jesus didn't need to atone for anybody. He didn't need to merit anything. He didn't need to pay any debt if your humble reply was enough to do it. Um, obviously, believing and trusting in God is not sufficient to merit or earn salvation. And so his decision on traditionalism, on my view, is not based upon human merit either. Nor is it on foreseen faith. Okay? So some... some forms of Arminianism have said something about God looking through the quarters of time or getting in his DeLorean, as Matt Chandler put it, and going into the future to see people who are going to believe and therefore, you know, choosing to elect them for salvation in some weird way. Okay. No, no serious scholar puts it that way, obviously, but it's not based upon something God knows about uh, in the future that something someone will do. So God's not seeing that someone will believe and, and, and tear the clothes and have faith in God, and therefore um, their, their, d- the decision to save them is based upon that. Um, and and my, my argument would just be, well, obviously the Bible does say that you're responsible as to whether you believe or not. And therefore, whether God foresees or foreknows or uh, is, is, is knowledgeable beforehand of your decision to do so, is, is not even in question. It's not even an issue because it, it, it doesn't matter. If that's your responsibility, in other words, if you're the one who decides whether or not you will come to faith and follow God and trust in him or not, then regardless of how God knows that in his eternal nature is irrelevant, okay? So if God knows about your faith prior to you having faith, irregardless, I mean, totally, completely, d- it doesn't matter if he knows of it beforehand. What matters is, and what's the distinction is, is he determined it beforehand. In other words, is he the one who's decided, is he the decisive cause of you believing in him or not? That's the distinction between Calvinism and not Calvinism. The, the foreknowledge of it, you, you have Calvinists who for, say they, you could say they foreknow it, Arminians who can say that he foreknows it, um, traditionalists who can say he foreknows it, um, even open theists, they can say he can predict it, okay? So it, that irrelevant to the discussion. The, the, the issue is, is whether or not you, the individual, is the decisive cause of whether you humble yourself and trust in him or you don't. Is God the decisive cause of whether you do that or are you the decisive cause of whether you do that or not? That's the, that's the, the, the point of distinction, not whether God knows it or how he knows it in his eternal nature. The goodness and the providence of God's, he goes on to write, but in the goodness and the providence of God's own will and purposes, Many would add, however, that the electing purposes of God is somehow accomplished without destroying free will and responsibility. Okay, and this is where the Calvinists will oftentimes appeal to mystery because they'll say, well, somehow he's accomplished this providence of his working um, and choosing them for salvation without destroying human free will and responsibility. And we just don't know how it works, but we just know it's true. God determines decisively causes whether somebody will believe or not, but yet he hasn't destroyed human free will and responsibility, and we just don't know how it works. This is what J.I. Packer called an antinomy, which he is just a redefined word of the word contradiction. God determines, God determines it, but yet you determine it. And that's just irreconcilable. We just don't know how it works. You just, but Bible teaches both, so you have to accept it. I'm sorry, it's not uncivil for me to say that's a contradiction. I love you, but I think you're holding to a contradiction if you behold to the fact that God, if you hold to a belief that God determines it, yet we determine it, and yet that, that's that's not logically possible. It is affirming a blatant contradiction. It's like what you'll hear some people say, well, there's two parallel lines that meet in eternity. Okay, if the lines meet, they're not parallel. It's, 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 a, it's a married bachelor. It's a round circle. It, it's, a, it's a blatant contradiction. 
And I, I'm sorry, I'm an apologist. I'm, I, I'm not going to accept the blatant contradiction of your systematic. And I, I'm nice in saying it. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I, I don't think you're damned to go into hell because you made a, a, a philosophical and logical error. I just think you're wrong. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm happy to say so because I think that error can lead to other uh, more practical mistakes as well. And it can lead to, um, uh, because theology um, drives your methodology, I think it can lead to poor methodology within the convention. And so I'm going to be kind enough to just point that out because I don't think that's a good theological position to hold to. Um, and, and I can say so without being uh, immoral or divisive or any of those kinds of things as well. So accordingly, no one is saved apart from God's plan Yet anyone, okay, so yeah, we would we'd all agree, God's not, no one's saved apart, apart from God's plan, but what is God's plan? Is his plan to play both sides of the chessboard? Ultimately, decisively cause whether you will move into Christ or not move into Christ, whether you will accept Christ or not accept Christ? Is that what God's plan is? Or God's, is God's plan to create free creatures who make their own decisions? That's, that's the point of contention here. It's not whether God has a plan or not. And yet anyone who repents and trusts in Christ will be saved course. But who's responsible for whether you repent and trust in Christ? Is God responsible for whether you repent and trust in Christ? Or are you responsible for whether you repent and trust in Christ? Because what some Calvinists are trying to do, especially the moderate form, are saying God's responsible for it and you're held responsible for it. And you're just supposed to accept that somehow because the Bible says both. Well, no, it doesn't say both. The Bible never says that God's responsible for how you respond to him. Never. And, and I would be glad to have that discussion and debate with anybody who would like to have that discussion and debate in a reasonable and rational way. Um, Danny Aiken or, or J.D. or any you want to talk about that, let's talk about it. But the Bible does not teach determinism, divine determinism, or what, what's sometimes called compatibilism. That's what it is. It's just a form of divine determinism, as we've uh, laid out here before. He goes on to um, the French theologian um, uh, this is referring to Armoraldianism, um, because this is where uh, four-point Calvinists come in. Is from that's how we get the name Armoraldianism from Armorald. Um He referred to this as God's secret or hidden decree. There is an admitted tension in this position, but a tension that need not be viewed as contradictory. Okay, so it's a, it's the same kind of thing with J.I. Packer. It's like this is an antinomy. And then he defines antinomy from the dictionary, and he says, but I wouldn't call it because antinomy is defined as a contradiction, a seeming contradiction. And then he goes on to say, well, it's just a seeming contradiction. It seems like a contradiction, but we're going to know it's not a contradiction because it's in the Bible. So it seems like a contradiction, but we're going to say it's not a contradiction. Okay. As an apologist, I deal with when people come to me and say, this is contradictory. And, and if you say something is contradictory then you're, you're, you're verifying its falseness, <laughs> okay? To call something contradictory is to say it's false because, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> and that's, that's a contradiction. And so, yeah, calling a, calling a contradiction just a tension. Now, the doctrine of Trinity is, maybe creates a tension. Um, the, 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 the omniscience of God creates a tension in our brains to understand how he knows all things or the eternal nature of God or uh, e the eternal existence of, of, of a being. Uh, that the, How, how um, God came into existence when he's always been, that, 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 that stretches our brain. That's a tension. That's not a contradiction. It's not saying a married bachelor. A married bachelor is a contradiction. Okay, Saying God's responsible and you're responsible is a contradiction. Okay. Either you're responsible or God's responsible, but it's not both. And to say it's both, it's it's just a blatant contradiction. And even John Piper, by the way, look up the word atenomy in J.I. Packer and John Piper. And John Piper wrote an article against J.I. Packer's article about calling this an atenomy because he does not, he, he at least agrees with me that you can't hold to a blatant contradiction in Scripture. And therefore, he sides on the side of Calvinism of saying that God is a decisive cause of our choices. We are not. Piper's very clear on that. That's why a lot of us enjoy, or at least appreciate, dealing with John Piper's commentaries and his his podcast because he's consistent in his Calvinism for the most part. Whereas a lot of these SBC type of Calvinists, like Danny Aiken and J.D. Greer, refer to atenemies and contradictions and, and seem to think it's okay and call them tensions and that we just have to all get along. I'm, I'm sorry, but 
that's not the way you do good hermeneutics, and it's not it's not good theology, and it's definitely not going to stand against a skeptical world, a growing skepticism within our world that's questioning the existence of God and sound theology. Because I hold to biblical inerrancy, because I hold such a high view of Scripture, I don't want to call the Bible contradictory, but that's exactly what these guys are doing, maybe unintentionally, but that's what they're doing. Um, and, and I just think, I, I don't want to settle there. I, I think I can have a higher view of Scripture than to say that it's contradictory and we should just accept that. Of course, this view is hotly debated among Southern Baptists, I agree, with alternative interpretations of scriptural passages being offered and both sides genuinely believe they are operating from a biblical basis. It's true. The reality is Southern Baptists will likely debate this point until the Lord returns. Probably so, brother. Why? Because of free will. Uh, Because that's also an interesting point, because um, the reason we're debating this point, according to Calvinism, if Calvinism is rightly applied, is because God has determined for us to debate this point, which, again, makes little sense. It it only makes sense when we have a a world of of autonomously free, libertarianly free creatures to even have this debate within the church in the first place. Otherwise, you get, in a sense, God debating himself, like God's determined A.W. Tozer to hold to... uh, a form of theology like me, and he and he's determined, you know, John Piper to hold to a theology like Calvin, and for them to disagree with each other, that make a lot of sense. All right, he goes on to talk about limited atonement, but I am going to, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> just skip over limited atonement, not because I don't think it's important. It's just that <laughs> read John, read read David Allen's book uh, on the atonement. He covers uh, the views, uh, I think, more extensively in, in our, our uh, bright broadcast on limited atonement. If you want to go over Aiken's comments on that, you can. Maybe when uh, David Allen's on again, we can go over it with him. Um, let's, let's skip to irresistible grace. Most Calvinists would see this as another fortunate choice, uh, unfortunate choice of words that stirs up unnecessary debate. Instead, they would prefer the phrase effectual calling. This doctrine asserts that those who are predestined to be saved are called to salvation. And again, that calling would be effectual, all right? So effectually or effectively. In other words, those God's unconditionally chosen, chosen for no apparent reason before the world began, are effectually or irresistibly called to salvation. In other words, God's responsible for how you respond. That's what it's talking about here, okay? They are not forced to come, but they are set free to come and do so willingly. So instead of uh, two analogies, okay, one analogy might be, okay, my 10-year-old son, uh, Caden, okay, if I go up to Caden and I grab him as his daddy and pick him up and carry him and put him in the car and he's going, daddy, put me down, put me down, I want to go, I don't want to go, that would be um, irresistible in the sense of force. And the Calvinists are going, no, 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 we we don't say God's dragging people uh, unwillingly. What we're saying is God changes their nature to make them willing, okay? So instead, the analogy would be, all right, I slip a little, um, you know, drug in in my son's drink um, because I know he's not going to want to come. He's not going to want to leave the playground. He's not going to want to leave what he's having fun doing. He won't ever want to go, you know, willingly. And so I slip a little something into his drink to makes, that makes him want to do what I want him to do. And he drinks it. And then I say, son, it's time to go home now. And because of that drug interacting with his chemicals, he goes, yeah, I want to do what you want me to do, daddy. I want to come with you. And he comes running to him, just jumps in the back of the car. Okay. Now, both of those are obviously uh, forceful or effectual in the sense that I'm the one who determined that my son got in the car. I'm the decisive cause, right? whether I slip the, drink, the drug in the drink or whether I pick him up and drag him and throw him in. The, 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 the more accurate description or the analogy of Calvinism is the drug view, okay, because it's God effectually, supernaturally, irresistibly doing some kind of, you know, supernatural work inside your heart that goes, oh, now I want to believe and I want to trust when I didn't want to before and I never would have wanted to before unless God did something irresistible and effectual on me. Um, but again, is that what the Bible teaches? You, you have to be the judge of, for yourself on that. We've got a lot of episodes on that, uh, that doctrine if you're interested. Timothy George strikes the balance of this teaching with human responsibility when he writes, God created human beings with free moral agency. What does he mean by free moral agency? Is he a compatibilist like John Piper is? 
I'm not sure because I have to study Timothy George's writings. He, he's known to be Calvinistic. He debated as a Calvinist in, in one debate that I listened to, which there was not much contention in the debate. And it was kind of a, kind of a letdown because there wasn't they never hit on the points of contention. Maybe maybe because this this issue wasn't brought up. But um, what do you mean by free moral agency? Do you mean free as in people do what they want to do? Like my son, Caden, after he took that drink, wanted to come. So he's doing what he wants to do. Is that what you mean by free? Because a lot of people don't define that as freedom. Just because you do what you desire is not a sufficient definition of freedom if those desires are ultimately being caused by someone outside yourself. Um, that's where most philosophers you know, steer away from compatibilism because it's just another form of hard determinism because it's just backing up the step one step to say that God determines your desires, but you determine your, your decisions based upon those desires, and therefore you're free because you're doing what you want. Okay, sorry, but uh, that's not a sufficient uh, <laughs> ground on which to base human freedom. Uh, it, it certainly wouldn't work in our own uh, judicial systems or even just, you know, rationally, I think, by any definition of the word. Um, he says, and he does not violate this even in the supernatural work of regeneration. Christ does not rudely bludgeon his way, bludgeon his way into the human heart. In other words, it's not like the physical grabbing you and dragging you, kicking and screaming. He changes your heart in a way, changes the human heart in a way that he does not abrogate our creaturely freedom. Now, what does he mean by that? Again, uh, he goes on to say, no, he beckons, he woos, he pleads, he pursues, and he waits and he wins. Sounds great. Sounds like a lot like a traditionalist view to me. Doesn't sound like Piper's view. Um, doesn't sound like what, the way they describe effectual calling uh, from the Calvinistic view. And so um, maybe, I don't know, I, I'd have to have Timothy George in the room to really push him on what he means by that. Because again, sometimes Calvinists have the same vocabulary, but a very different dictionary. And you have to ask them what do they mean by woo, plead, pursue, waits and wins, um, and, and how they mean those words in order to, to really define their uh, their understanding. Then he goes on to perseverance. Now, um, because of time, and we can go through some of that at another time, but he goes on to write this at the very end. He says, finding biblical balance, theologically and practical considerations, grasping the magnitude of this issue is a daunting task for finite sinful humans. A good dose of humility is certain, certainly in order as we attempt to both understand the Bible's teaching and work alongside those with whom we may not see eye to eye. What are some theological and practical principles that can guide us? I would offer six suggestions. This is one of the reasons I wanted to skip ahead because there's quite a bit here. It says, one, in our doctrine of salvation, we should start with God and not man. Amen. The Bible affirms that salvation is from the Lord, and by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We should be God-centered in all of our theology, especially the doctrine of salvation. Agreed. The Bible teaches that salvation is God's work. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He takes the initiative. He is the truth. He, he is the true seeker. Again, that to me, point one, pretty much just affirms what we've already talked about is that God initiates salvation and therefore leaves the, the question open as to whether or not man is responsible for how he responds to God's seeking the lost. In other words, when when God provides the gift of faith through the gospel, bringing the, the truth and grants people the means by which they may believe and uh, provides atonement for them, uh, he provides that provision, um, he, he grants that ability. Um, who's responsible? Who's the decisive cause of whether or not they receive that gift and that provision of God's grace or not. That's where it comes down to. Point two, we should affirm the truth both of God's sovereignty and human free will. The abstract of principles was the founding confession for the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It was penned by Basil Manley Jr. in 1859. Manley, Manley was a Calvinist. And yet Article 4 on providence reveals a healthy theological balance in our Baptist forefather, Manley wrote, God for from eternity decrees or permits all things that come to pass and perpetually upholds, directs, and governs all creatures and all events. Yet so as not in any wise to be the author or approver of sin, nor to destroy the free will and responsibility of intelligent creatures. Again, it goes back to definitions. Um, when, when a Calvinist says free will, if he's a compatibilist like John Piper, 
And most Calvinists that I'm aware of theologically, when they say free will and responsibility, what they mean is compatibilistic free will, meaning you do what you want to do. God is ultimately determining your nature, which determines your desires, and therefore you're acting according to your nature and your desires, but those are accordance to God's decree. He decides your nature. From birth, it's born in complete inability, moral inability, um, until you're regenerated. And if you're regenerated because he unconditionally chose you, then you will want to come to him, and that's free will on their definition. So what does he mean by free will? Responsibility, for us, silly us, it means the ability to respond. In other words, we're able to respond to God's call and appeal to be reconciled. For the Calvinist, that's not what responsibility means. Responsibility means culpability, even though you cannot respond. Because of the imputed guilt of Adam, you are held culpable for your sin and your rejection of God, even though you cannot willingly respond even to his life-giving truth and his appeals to be reconciled from the fall. That's what Calvinists mean by responsibility. But they use free will and responsibility just like we do. So you have to ask the question. You have to push and say, okay, what do you, what do you mean by author? There are some who define author differently than others. We have quotes from Calvin himself saying, uh, referring to God as author of evil in, a, in an affirmation way of saying it, along with quoting Augustine. Um, and so what, what do you mean by approver or author? How is author different than determiner of or one who brings about sin? Again, we've gone over a lot of those different quotes from other Calvinists, and you just have to ask yourself where where do these particular Calvinists stand on those issues unless unless we're able to have a discussion and talk through those things? Um, you know, we, we don't know unless this, they define their terms. It says, many Baptists believe the Bible teaches that God predestines and elects persons to salvation, but that he does so in such a way as to do no violence to their free will and responsibility. This is where I get the A equals not A, blatant contradictions again. Um, the antinomies. So God predestines, in other words, God's a decisive cause of who will repent and believe unto salvation. But he does that somehow in some mysterious way that you're still free and you're still the one who is deciding whether you will repent and believe and to be saved. So you're the decisive cause and God's a decisive cause. And it's just somehow, we just don't know how it is, but God is the decisive cause and you're the decisive cause. God's not the decisive cause of your decisive cause, but you're the decisive cause of, so it just, he goes, you just go, okay, <laughs> what, what, what is it that you believe? How do you define these terms? And again, I'm not trying to be divisive in saying so. I'm trying to be clear. There's a difference between being divisive and being clear. I'm trying to be clear about, about where you where you stand. Um, he goes on to say, do no violence to their free will and responsibility to repent from sin and believe in the gospel. Is there a tension here? Yes. Uh, tension is just another word for contradiction in some of their minds, at least in my estimation. Okay. Is there a contradiction here? Yes. Okay. Is there a divine mystery? Is in other words, is there a contradiction? Absolutely. Yes. Their by their definition, I think. But in other words, I'm not saying they think there's a contradiction here. What I'm saying is they think it looks like a contradiction, but they know it's not because the Bible's not contradictory. So they say, yeah, it looks like a contradiction, but we're going to maintain that it's not, and we're going to appeal to attention and a mystery. Okay. All I'm saying is drop effectuality out of your soteriology. Drop this concept of divine determinism out of your soteriology. Let man be responsible for his responses to God, and you don't have that tension anymore. The Bible doesn't necessitate divine determinism, so why are you? Why does your soto soteriology necessitate total inability from birth? unless God does an effectual, irresistible work first, because the Bible doesn't teach that, in my estimation. So why, why are you having to appeal to this quote-unquote mystery or this antinomy or this contradiction if the Bible never teaches total inability and irresistible grace? I'm just, just saying. Um, many believe this is what Paul felt when at the end of his magnificent treatment of the subject in Romans 9 through 11, he concludes with a doxology of praise and says, Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and traceable his ways. If you find it a challenge to fathom the depths of doctrine, then you are in good company. Um, again, um, appealing to mystery is one thing. Appealing to contradiction is another. And so I, I think using passages like that, to explain that his ways are higher than our ways and we can never understand fully the mysteries of God is one thing. It's another thing to say um, that the Bible teaches a, a very seeming contradiction, but we're just going to say it's not a contradiction because the Bible doesn't have contradictions. I don't think that that's what Paul was trying to defend with that doxology.
He says, recognize that extreme positions on either side of the issue are biblically unbalanced, theologically unhealthy, and practically undesirable. Would agree there are extremes on both sides. And, and I appreciate the fact that there are modified, moderate, lower forms of Calvinism. I appreciate the fact that they're not taking things hyper uh, in a hyper way, anti-evangelistically. Does not mean I still can't call out where I think they're wrong or illogical in a civil way. Biblically, we affirm the truths of all of God's word. Words like called, chosen, election, foreknowledge, predestination are in the Holy Scripture. That's correct. That's why we can't stick our head in the sand and pretend like it's not important. We should embrace them. Agreed. We should examine them. Agreed. We should seek to understand them. Amen. Always remembering that intelligent and godly people will likely embrace differing interpretations. Why? Free will. (laughs) It's the only reason that good godly people would embrace differing interpretations. Only rational explanation for that is free will. Uh, Words like believe, evangelist, go, preach, receive, and repent are also in the Bible. Biblical balance requires that we embrace and affirm these as well. Amen to that. And we can, without appealing to a contradiction, by the way we interpret through the the hermeneutic of of traditionalism uh, versus the um, compatibilistic Calvinism that we see from Calvin and, and Piper today. Theologically, we dare not to be seduced into living in a theological ghetto that may espouse a nice, neat doctrinal system, but that does not, but does so at the expense of wholesome, comprehensive theology. Practically, we must not become manipulative and gimmicky in our presentation of the gospel, as if the conversion of the lost depends ultimately or even primarily on us. Neither should we be lulled into an, a, a, an apathy towards <clears throat> uh, personal evangelism and global missions. Agree there. Attempting to construct a doctrine of double predestination wherein God elects some to damnation, hates the lost, and consigns non-elect infants to the fires of hell would be viewed by most in the SBC as irresponsible and lacking in biblical support. Um, Any theology that does not result in a hot heart for the souls of lost persons is a theology not worth having. I fear that some extreme forms of Calvinism have so warped the mind and frozen the hearts of its advocates that if they saw a person screaming at the top of their lungs, what must I do to be saved, they would hesitate or even neglect the gospel for fear of somehow interfering with the work of the Holy Spirit. That would be a, a very extreme version of Calvinism for sure. Um, but, but the fact that, that the logic of Calvinism would could lead somebody to that kind of extrema, doesn't that make you wonder whether Calvinism is taught in the first place? In other words, can't we just drop the you know, this total inability slash irresistibility concepts, i.e. determinism, um, and not have to deal with fatalistic um, applications like this. Um, If the initials JC bring first to your mind the name John Calvin rather than Jesus Christ, and you fancy yourself more of an evangelist for Calvinism than Christ, then this latter word of concern is particularly for you. Never forget that the greatest theologian who ever lived was also the greatest missionary evangelist who ever lived. His name was Paul. Point four, act with personal integrity in your ministry when it comes to this issue. Put your theological cards on the table in plain view for all to see. Amen. Do not go into a church under the cloak or deception. I would also say do not go into a presidential nomination without a cloak of deception or dishonesty. And again, I'm not saying that J.D. is being intentionally dishonest. I, it just seems like to me, if you affirm the Acts 29 distinctives, which you did, you had to do to be an Acts 29 church by their own. I, I'm just saying, did, did you were, did you change since then? Because that's affirming irresistible grace and total inability. Point to the distinctive. It's just blatantly obvious Calvinism. Again, just come right out and say, yes, I affirm point two's distinctive of the Acts 29 network, or no, I actually disagree with that now. I've changed my views since I signed that back when I became an Acts 29 church. Um, just tell us. And, and it, I, I would love if you've you've softened and more modified your views and you don't affirm Acts 29 network's statements anymore. But tell me that. Let me know that <laughs> so so I can know whether you where you believe that, because I just have to assume that you still hold to statements that you've signed off on and agreed to in the past. If you do, you will more than likely split a church or a convention, J.D. I'm, I'm just, tr- honestly, be honest with where you stand. If you affirm that, then tell us. 
Um, you can wound the body of Christ, damage the ministry God has given you, and leave a bad taste in the mouth of everyone. Let me give an example. I'm a pre-trib, pre-mill, pre-mill in my eschatology. It would be inappropriate for me to interview with the church and continue the discussion as if I discovered, if I discovered that it was, uh, it was committed to an all millennial position. Now let me address our topic. In other words, if you, in other words, be honest about where you stand. Right. That's all. That's that's what Aiken is is arguing there. Amen. I would also say that's true when you're running for for office. Be real, real clear with where you stand. And, and affirming statements that John Calvin makes about atonement doesn't doesn't mean you avoid being a classical or a Calvinist. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. It does. It doesn't hit our point of contention. Um, he goes on to say, now let me address our topic. If a person is strongly committed to the five points of Calvinism, then he should be honest and transparent about that when talking to a church and a search committee. Amen. And if you're a four-point Calvinist, J.D. Greer, who affirms as the X29 network teaches, and you're running for president, you should come right out and say it so that the, the, the people know who they're voting for. Just come right out and say, yes, I affirm the distinction of, distinctives of the X29 network because I'm an X29 church and I signed off on it, and I believe it. He should not hide behind statements like, I am a historic Baptist. That statement basically says very little, if anything, and is less than forthcoming. Be honest and completely so. Thank you, Aiken. You're absolutely right. If it is determined that you are not a good fit for that congregation or for that denominational presidency, presidency rejoice in the sovereign providence of God and trust him to place you in a ministry assignment that is a good fit. God will honor such integrity. Amen. Great point of advice. And I pray J.D. will follow it by letting us know if he still affirms or does not affirm the Acts 29 distinctives. Teach the issues to your people, especially your youth. Sometimes pastors get frustrated when they send their students off to college and seminary and they come back different. Sometimes they go to a liberal institution and they return questioning, jettisoning their faith. Other times they go to a conservative school and return as double predestinarian, superlapsarian, extreme Calvinist. And now question the public invitation and personal evangelism training and uh, redefine into insignificance the Great Commission. It has been my experience that this latter malady is more often caught from immature fellow students than from godly professors. This observation is not intended to absolve our colleges and seminaries of their responsibility. It is to say, however, that we are to we are we do our people no favors when a dumbed down theology in the local church. I believe we should raise the biblical and theological bar in our churches, and we should do so immediately. Hey, man, Aiken, man, these points, these latter points are awesome. Love this. I believe we should train our people so they mature to the point that we can consider the great theological debates between Augustine, and Pelagius, Luther, Calvin, Erasmus, Calvinists, and Arminians. Traditionalists never make the list. Huh. Why don't you bring David Allen into the discussion? <laughs> Not historical enough. Well, C.S. Lewis or some of these other guys that held to, I don't know. It's an, anyway, I also believe we should help uh, help them mature to the point that we can familiarize them with the five points of Calvinism, the humanism of enlightenment, and the destructive criticism of rationalism, anti-supernatural, and the Jesus seminar. Some may protest that these issues will be over their heads. I would strongly disagree. If our schools can teach our children chemistry and biology and physics and geology, <laughs> geology and algebra and geometry and political science and economics, then we can certainly teach them theology. Amen. It sounds like one of my sermons. I actually have a point with this. You could teach, if a kid can learn how to order at Starbucks, he can learn what propitiation is. <laughs> That's one of the points I make. You don't, you set, we set our bars way too low for our students. And I, I hate the statement, our students are our future. No, the students are the present. Um, and we, we should be demanding more of them. We, we watch them in, in uh, the, uh, the Olympics. We, we expect high um, participation for young people in, in academics and in, in, in sports and in every other field. Why not in theology? I, I, that just bugs me to death when we don't have a high bar of expectation for our students in theology uh, and apologetics. Christian ethics and uh, philosophy, we as a local church can prepare them in advance for what they will encounter so that various ideologies can be careful, critiqued, and examined positions intelligently rejected for the errors they contain. That's what I think I'm trying to do with, with Aiken's earlier portion of this article. I'm trying to intelligently reject for the errors you contain in love towards you, in respect towards you, Dr. Aiken. Um, this is not trying to be uh, 
filled with animosity towards you or anger towards you. It's tried to bring an intelligent rejection of illogical claims of, of more modified Armoraldian Calvinism. Again, it requires a gradual and intentional maturing process. You don't reach calculus to as a first grader, but to neglect this area is to fail in preparing them to deal with the critical theological and so, uh, social challenges of our day. Um, point six, recognize that our Baptist faith and message 2000 is a well-constructed canopy under which very varying perspectives on this issue can peacefully and helpfully coexist. I agree that they can uh, co coexist. Um, I, I just think you can coexist while still uh, bringing critique in love and 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 pushing each other to to more biblical uh, conclusions about these particular views. Pelagians, Arminians, and open theists will not feel at home in the Southern Baptist family. We will love them while also disagreeing with them. Is there a place for differing positions on the issues of election, the extent of the atonement and calling, as well as how we do missions, evangelism, and give the invitation? I'm convinced that the answer is yes. Further, I believe we will be better for it theologically and practically as we engage each other in respectful and serious conversations. As one who considers himself to be a true compatibilist, okay, I had not read this far, far down. Um, honestly, when I first read this article, I kind of stopped at point four. <laughs> so he just now says he's a compatibilist. I've got all the major writings of compatibilistic Calvinistic scholars. And I, I've defined it and described it the best I know how is ultimately, like I've just said, it's a form of determinism by which God is uh, determining ultimately men's nature and their desires in such a way that they are still free to do as they wish. But, of course, they only wish to do what their nature uh, entails. And since God is ultimately controlling their nature, either i.e. De decreed from the fall to be in a totally incapacitated state or uh, regenerated by irresistible means, regeneration, um, uh, that's compatible. That's just basic Calvinism. So I, I don't know how you avoid the charges of Calvinism by, by affirming compatibilism. Um, he goes uh, on affirming the majestic mystery of both divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Again, we, we affirm divine sovereignty and human responsibility too. We just don't define sovereignty as to mean determinism. And we don't define responsibility as meaning uh, men are culpable for what they do, even though they don't have any ability to respond otherwise. But nevertheless, that's neither here nor there. I have been challenged and strengthened in my own theological understanding by those less reformed than I, as well as those more reformed than I happen to be. Because of our passionate commitments to the glory of God, the Lordship of Christ, biblical authority, salvation by grace through faith, and the Great Commission, we work in wonderful harmony with each other, and I suspect we always will. Point seven, finally, as a denomination, we must devote as much passion and energy to studying the word as we have to defining it. Let us be known for being rigorous, biblical, searching the scriptures to determine what God really says on this and other key doctrinal issues. For the most part, we are not doing this, and our theological shallowness is an indictment of our current state and embarrassment of our history. I agree. So one of the reasons I think, actually, and I'm not trying to be mean in saying this, I think one of the reasons for the rise of Calvinism is because of our shallowness uh, uh, of knowledge of other robust theological worldviews. I think if you have two robust theological worldviews to consider, more people will land on traditionalism. If you have Calvinism and namby-pamby, seeker-sensitive, Joel Olstein type of n nothing theology, then yeah, Calvinism looks real appealing. But that's been part of the problem within our, our, our culture over the last uh, two decades is that it's either Calvinism as the deep, robust theological worldview or this namby-pamby, stick your head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist stuff that, that I think is an embarrassment. Furthermore, let none of us seek to be recognized so much for being Calvinist, five-point modified or otherwise, but rather for being thoroughgoing Biblicist Christians, um, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I agree. Um, here's the conclusion. The great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, was a five-point Calvinist. Some would debate whether he was a true five-point Calvinist or not. Um, and a passionate evangelist, soul winner. Um, and he goes on to talk about that for a while, but I've gone on forever and ever, and my throat's hurting. So that's <laughs> what my body's saying. Shut up, Leighton, you talk too much, which I've been saying for a long time. So um, my, my voice agrees. So I'm going to end it with that, but just say in, in closing, um, 
I'm not saying anything in animosity towards JD, towards Dr. Aiken. Um, I, I think they're great brothers in the Lord. We've got so much more in common than we have at odds with each other. But sociology, uh, you know, <laughs> as Dr. Pritchett called me a sociologist the other day. You're, he said to call it, you know, you're a sociologist. I guess that's true. I, I do sociology. I, I, I want our sociology to be good. And as a former Calvinist, I believe Calvinism is just is bad sociology. Um, I believe reformed tulip type of sociology is is not biblical. But that doesn't mean I hate Calvinists. Okay, I can love Calvinists while not liking Calvinism, while disagreeing with the 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 tulip systematic and and the claims that it makes, especially with regard to total inability and irresistible grace, uh, and unconditional election for that matter. Um, and, and, and I can bring charge without being uncivil. And we need to be civil in our discussion, but stand firm in love with what we believe about God's love and provision for every man, woman, boy, and girl. Help me spread the word. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.